Και τώρα ερχόμαστε στον κύριο καθηγητή του Πανεπιστημίου. Συγγνώμη για τη φωνή μου. Στο Πανεπιστήμιο τη Βιέννη. Οπότε θα μιλήσει ο κύριο Μίλια για έναν άλλο επισκέπτη στην Κύπρο, αλλά αυτή τη φορά όχι πολύ καλά γνωστό. Πρέπει να μου επιτρέψετε, επιτρέψετε μου να ευχαριστήσω τον κύριο Σαμπατακάκη που, μου, που κατάφερε να στέκομαι εδώ μπροστά σα χωρί να ιδρώσω. Δηλαδή, αυτή τη στιγμή εδώ φυσάει ένα ωραίο δροσερό αράκι. <laughs> Ζέφυρο, εντάξει, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Να είστε καλά. <laughs> Ωραίο. Λοιπόν, θα αλλάξω γλώσσα. Dear colleagues, my dear friends, dear students. In Vienna, the city where I'm living, in 1735, while Balski was still on the island of Cyprus, as Panagiotis Dukelis just showed, In 1735, an impressive book of nearly 1,000 pages was published. This is its title page. It reads as follows. Peregrinos in Jerusalem, Fremdling zu Jerusalem oder ausführliche Reisbeschreibungen, worinen Pater Angelicus Maria Müller, Ordens der Diener unserer lieben Frauen, bohemischer Provinz etc. etc. seine fünf Hauptreisen, die er in Europa, Asia und Afrika vor einigen Jahren getan und unter Gottes Schutz glücklich vollendet hat, richtig erzählt and so on. This was already the second edition of the extensive travel dog. The first had been arranged in Prague what was put into print in three volumes from 1729 to 1732. The author of the book was Angelicus Maria Müller, a friar of the Servites, the Order of the Servants of Mary, a travelogue written in German language about a journey in the Eastern Mediterranean that lasted for exactly two years, is a very interesting document of the time. Nevertheless, it's quite unknown and still a terra incognita from a scientific point of view. Kyriakos Simopoulos is aware of the book and refers to it in the second volume of his Xeni Taxidiotes in Elada, Athens, <coughs> 1981. He devotes one single page to Müller, unfortunately quite full of inaccuracies. Ilya Hatsipanayoti Sangmeister presents Müller and his work with very reliable information in her annotated bibliography of the travel literature of the 18th century, published in 2006. She outlines the content and the character of this travelogue, but the nature of an annotated bibliography doesn't allow to get into any details. Monographs on Müller do, as far as I know, not exist. There are two scientific articles focusing on religious aspects of his personality. Both of them are quite short and were published, in a couple, were published a couple of years ago. There are also some brief mentions of him in a few surveys, and that's it. So it just seems uh, as legitimate as interesting to shed light on him and the picture he draws from the Eastern Mediterranean in general, and in specific, the island of Cyprus. But here we already get into severe trouble, since what we know about him is very fragmentary. Most facts about his life are to be taken out of his travel log. Archival material does not exist, except some mentions of him in old registers, which provide us with the mere basic data of his life, that of his birth and death. According to the register of the Servite Friars in Vienna, He was born on the 21st of January 1677 in Innsbruck. So he was a Tyrolean by birth, a subject of the Habsburg Empire and not a German, as is stated mostly in the narrow lines that scientific literature has about him. We don't know anything about his background, the family he was born in, about his childhood, nor how or where he was educated. 
For us, his life starts late because we only know about him as a friar. In 1714, when the Bohemian province of the Servit Order was founded, Miller was assigned to the new province. During the following years, he seems to have developed a bond with Bohemia. But in the early 1720s, he expressed a strong desire to leave the Bohemian province and to live, in a, to live a more strict form of the eremitic life at Monte Senario, the cradle of the order near Florence. In 1725, Miller was granted permission of the superiors to withdraw to the woods of Monte Senario. However, his health was poor. Doctors soon discouraged, discouraged him from the austere way of life and sent him back to the Priory of Florence for further treatment. In September of 1725, he was allowed to travel to Rome, where he recovered quickly. And while recovering, he explained to the oldest general his plans for the future, a journey to Jerusalem and the holy sites of Palestine. The oldest general agreed provided that Müller would be able to obtain the permission of the Pope, zumal in keiner unter Excommunikationsstraf ohne päpstlicher Lizenz ad partes in fidelium in der ungläubigen Länder zu reisen befugt ist. As no one is allowed, otherwise he will be excommunicated to travel without the license of the Pope ad partes in fidelium to the lands of the infidels as he records in the first chapter of the travel log. But the orders general himself showed him the way to obtain the license, and so, without any problems, he got the permission of Benedict XIII already on 12th September 1725. As a traveler, Müller presents himself as the follower of St. Philip Benizi, one of the founding figures of the order. According to the Savit tradition, Benizi went to the Levant in the 13th century in order to spread the Savit confraternity of the sorrowful Virgin Mary with the black scapular. Müller stresses that during the life of Benizi, the Savit confraternities flourished in Asia and Africa and gained many members. Over the course of the centuries, they disappeared, and Miller liked to see himself as the revivalist of Benizi's work. When Miller started his travel to the East, he was equipped with a privilege from the Orders General, allowing him to establish new confraternities in the Eastern Mediterranean. And, interesting enough, he started his long journey quite immediately after he got the OK from the Pope. Only one week later, on the 20th of September, he left Rome and headed for Livorno, where he boarded a ship. This is a map out of his book, documenting his journeys, not very accurate, however. Leaving the port of Livorno on the 27th of September 1725, Miller traveled via Corsica, Sicily, Methoni, Crete, Cyprus, Beirut, and Saida to Nazareth where he arrived half a year later on the 23rd of March, 1726. Via Jaffa, he then traveled to Jerusalem, April 1726, visiting the sites of, of the Holy Land. After that, Müller decided to stay in the Levant. When Cyprus, Rhodes, Kos, Chios, and Troy, he reached Constantinople on the 19th of August, 1726. After six weeks, he left the city, going first to Smyrna, then via Alexandria and Rosette to Cairo, and after that to Aleppo and Cyprus. It was from there that he headed home. He left the island on the 7th of June, 1727. Via Crete and Malta, he reached Rome, arriving there on the 27th of September, exactly two years after he had started from Livorno. I show you Müller as a traveler. You can see him here riding on donkey, author of Singer Affairs, and you see behind the island of Cyprus. It's the frontispiece of the travelogue 1735. 
The moment Müller's ship left the harbor of Livorno on the 27th of September 1725 is the moment when he began to document his journey in detail. He wrote down day by day everything that happened and even if nothing happened, he noted it down. In one of the two articles I mentioned previously, the Czech historian Veronika Czapska points out that there is a long tradition of keeping diaries in the Soviet order and that Müller should have been familiar with that. None of Müller's diaries of the journey is left. However, it is obvious that they once built the base for the, for the printed reports that started to appear on the market in 1729, which was about two years after the journey had come to an end. Ilya Khatsyapaniotis Sangmeister summed up the main characteristics of Müller's travel log in a perfect manner. I quote, Müllers Schilderung seiner Reisen unterscheidet sich stark in der Thematik und in ihrer Behandlung von den übrigen Berichten von Pilgerreisen. Außergewöhnlich ist das gesteigerte Interesse an der Natur der bereisten Regionen und an der Zivilisation ihrer Völker, das mit der Bemühung des Autors einhergeht, seine Beobachtungen genau und umfassend nicht nur in Bezug auf das Heilige Land aufzuzeichnen. Mehrere Verweise auf antike und byzantinische Autoren Homer, Ptolemäus, Plinius, Suda sowie Zitate aus ihren Werken in der Originalsprache verstärken den säkulären Ton und bezeugen die humanistische Bildung von Müller. Die seinerzeit üblichen negativen Stereotype über die Orthodoxen gehören zu den wenigen Bestandteilen des Textes, die die Zugehörigkeit des Autors zum Klerus in Erinnerung rufen. With this in mind, and Φοβάμαι ότι τώρα δεν μεταφράστηκε αυτό και που να το έχετε στη... Ναι. Ε, και αν θα το μεταφράσω τώρα θα χάσουμε χρόνο. Συνεχίζω παρόλο αυτό. With this in mind, sorry, okay. With this in mind, we are ready to follow Müller to Cyprus. Um, Symphonisame Kati, ne, yafto. He visited the island three times. Müller's first stop on the island lasted for two weeks, from 14th to 17th of February 1726. He had to find a ship that would take him to the Holy Land. The second stop was planned to only last for five days, from 23rd to the 28th of March uh, of May 1727. The ship he travelled with was on its way to Constantinople and had to load wine for the English merchants at the capital. In the end, unfortunate winds delayed the departure from Cyprus for a whole week. The longest stop on the island was the third and ultimate one, lasting for about four weeks from the 8th to, of May to the 4th of June 1727. You see, altogether about two months he stayed on the island. Once again, Müller's ship had to be loaded and filled with various products that have had to be bought on the markets of Cyprus. Cyprus was never the final destination of one of Müller's tours. While it is evident that his main focus of interest were the holy sites of Palestine, this, he still tried hard to provide the reader of his travelogue with valid information about the regions, islands and cities on his way. In the case of Cyprus, he first gives us the physical dimensions of the island. Sie hat in der Länge von Capo Bafo bis Capo Sant'Andrea 182 und in der Breite bei 68 welche Meilen, together with a statement about its political importance which was outstanding and equal to that of the eminent island of Crete. We are also given a very brief outline of the political history, possessed and reigned for a long time by kings, particularly those of the House of Lusignan, the last empress von dem Haus Coronari, <coughs> Catarina Cornaro, made the island a present to the Venetians. They ruled until 1571 when it came under the sovereignty of the Turks. The soil of the island is very fertile, and it produces grain, oil, salt, cotton, silk, lemon and orange fruits, as well as capers, as we are told. 
But first and foremost, exquisite wines, a real aurum potabile. The most important cities are Nicosia and Famagosta, the first a fortified city, city with a round shape located almost in the middle of the island. It is here that the Basa resides, who is in charge of the whole island. Famagosta, on the other hand, is a very old city and fortress, eine uralte Stadt und Festung, much more fortified than Nicosia, and there's a seaport nearby. It is Famagosta that the offenders as well, uh, that the offenders as well as the prisoners of war are kept. The reader learns that the island has, a dif has, different, ha has had different names over the course of time. He also learns that Cyprus is the island of Venus, who had a temple at Paphos, where St. Paul was arrested and St. Barnabas was born. The whole temple, including the picture of Venus, broke into pieces while St. Barnabas was preaching. One hour away from Paphos is the grotto, worin die gottseligen Siebenschläfer mehr als 300 Jahre ohne Erwachen laut historischen Kirchengeschichten sollen geschlafen haben in which the Pier 7 sleepers slept more than 300 years without ever waking up, according to historical church tradition. When Miller's ship on the evening of the 15th of February 1726 passes Capo Bianco and Capo Gato, he explains these two names, being fascinated in particular by the story of the last. It is the old telling of the trained cats and the snakes at the monastery of Hagios Nikolaos that he writes down, and that is to be read already, for instance, in the travelogue of Francesco Suriano, who traveled more than 200 years before. And you remember, um, Guillermo Maltese uh, showed us uh, much more texts talking about these cats, and we got <coughs> Also, um, Ms. Shipova um, showed us the Czech documents um, telling the same story. But Müller adds some personal observations. I quote and translate. That the story of the trained cats is totally plausible, he notes down, I myself can attest. Because during my last journey, while I was on my way from Aleppo to Cyprus, I observed in the small city of Arnica ein weiss kloster cats, a white cat from the monastery of the Honorable Fratres Franciscans. The cat always came into the refectory with wounded and bloody ears. When I asked the pater guardian about the reason, he answered that the cat was very important to the monastery ein großes Kapital, as it was trained and used to fight the snakes and kill them. By doing so, the cat often got wounded and bitten in the ears. And then, having passed Capogato and approaching Lemesos, Miller explains that at this location there's a sea harbor where some time ago cotton and silk was traded, a trade that now has been transferred to Salinas. What can easily be detected from my last paragraphs is the mixture of information and anecdotes that Miller presents and that keep his travelogue interesting and entertaining even to the modern reader. Due to the limits of time, I will not be able to give you a detailed picture of all the facets of his writing. Generally speaking, we notice that he is not much fascinated by architecture nor ancient, nor modern, except the building our monasteries are connected to the Bible. He is more interested in the life and behavior of the local population, but what he loved most, besides talking about religious matters, is nature. So one of the most impressive pages, a passages of his writing about Cyprus is when he makes us familiar with a garden outside Limiso Lemesol. It is, as he tells us, the garden of the father of his Greek landlord, who was a man of high age and immense wealth. 
Müller was shown first the impressive water supply of the garden. At a fountain there was a huge water wheel similar to the biggest mill wheel um, that was moved by a donkey. The wheel scooped water with wooden pots, which was directed via several canals and furrows into every corner of the enormous garden. This irrigation system watered the plants consisting of various types of exotic fruits, herbs and flowers. Lemons, bitter oranges, pomegranates, olives, almonds, figs, carrots, saffron, coriander, sugarcane, capers, rhubarb, colocinth, scammony, tulips, carnations, and the most rare and multicolored ranunculus, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that, here I quote again, this garden, incomparable to others, seemed to be a little paradise. Because lemon fruits, pomegranates, and limes covered the ground around the trees in a way that often I could not set food on the ground without touching them. You can observe the most uncommon plants of this garden in the following engraving, end of quotation. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> you missed Famagosta. This is the engraving he's talking about with the plants. But not only the plants were remarkable. Miller was led to a wooden hut surrounded by a huge number of mulberry trees. You will guess what Miller was shown here. Correct, the production of silk. He describes it very vividly and in detail. Another impressive passage is to be found when Miller gets familiar with the berühmten Amianti or Asbeststein, Asbestos, during his last stay on the island. And of course, he also documents the bird hunt in spring, during which enormous numbers of small birds are trapped then cooked with thawed, salt and vinegar and put into barrels. Many of these barrels were shipped to Italy every year. Da diese war als ein sonderbare Delikatesse verzehret wird, where this product is consumed as a special delicacy. The Italians. And he also writes about Monte Croce and about la polvere di Cipro, the aromatic powder shipped from Cyprus all over the world that is well known in our European pharmacies as a useful thing. And about the salt production of Salinas where every year in August 30 large ships are loaded with salt and sent to Syria and other destinations. And about the Angora goats with the long shining hair. And then again and again, he writes about the wine of Cyprus. When the ships Miller is traveling with leave the ports of Cyprus, even the sailors made sure that they got a barrel of wine for the journey. This wine of Cyprus, Miller notes down at a quote and translator last time, is the most delicious of all the wines to be found in the whole Levant. It has got a bright red color, can be stored up to eight years and more without losing quality, and gets brighter and brighter the older it grows. End of quotation and end of my presentation. <laughs> Although I would like to tell you more about Müller and his magnificent travel log, there's no time left. But the wonderful thing <coughs> is, that in future you will be able to travel by your own through the pages of this book easily and comfortably. It is incorporated in a great way into the digital database of travel literature which was enabled with the generosity of the Silvia Ioannou Foundation and implemented by the fabulous work of many scholars. Congratulations and many thanks for this great tool to all who are responsible for its existence, we are all looking forward to working with it. A very warm thank you to the organizers of the conference for the kind invitation. And last but not least, thank you very much for your attention.
Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την ανακοινωσή σας. Πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα.